I guess I'll begin by introducing myself. I'm Bridie McGreevy. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Communication and Journalism at University of Maine. I'm also uh, on the Maine Shellfish Advisory Council. I hold the public seat, and in that role, I try to provide social science expertise uh, and focus on water quality. So Cole has asked me to help facilitate this next session. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Scott Soares, who is coming to us from the Massachusetts Shellfish Initiative. He's the owner of the Boston Bay Consulting, drawing on over 25 years of experience. He offers government relations services, business and project development, and management assistance to those working in agriculture, fisheries, and food systems. He's also served as the USDA Rural Development State Director for Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island, and Executive Director of the Cranberry Marketing Committee of the United States. Mr. Soares began his career at the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources, where he held a variety of leadership positions, including the Commonwealth's first aquaculture program director, and culminating with a gubernatorial appointment as commissioner, commissioner of the department in 2009. So, thank you for being here. Thanks very much, and I'm really happy to be here. I always cringe when I send those and you read the whole thing off. But <laughs> great, it seems to be working. Okay, so uh, I have been asked here today uh, to talk uh, about a number of uh, things. To start off with, uh, to really look at, uh, and thanks again for the opportunity to be here. Uh, to specifically represent the Mass Shellfish Initiative, although as was mentioned in my intro. Uh, I am the owner of Boston Bay Consulting, and I work on a variety of different projects in Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, primarily Southeast New England. Uh, but today I'm specifically representing the Shellfish Initiative, who I'm supporting as their consulting coordinator. Uh, in addition to the specific update on the MSI, uh, which I'll refer to throughout the talk, uh, I've been asked to cover a range of shellfish information that was suggested as being of interest to you here in Maine. And I sat in through the morning session, and I can attest that I uh, I think some of it will be uh, interesting to you given what's happening with shellfish here uh, in Maine itself. Uh, I'll also apologize for the length of my presentation. I have quite a few slides to get through. Uh, but when I first uh, was asked about characterizing shellfish in Massachusetts, I thought it was most important to first start looking at uh, the definition of the Bay State uh, and our uh, environment uh, for its historically significant uh, as a good place uh, for, for shellfish generally. Uh, we have vast nearshore resources, not unlike what you have uh, here in Maine, uh, although acreage-wise, or uh, miles coastline-wise, we're about half, or less than half of what you have here in Maine. Uh, nonetheless, we are pretty unique in that Massachusetts is located in confluence of two uh, pretty unique uh, uh, bodies of water, uh, the cold nutrient-rich uh, Gulf of Maine, where you all are situated, uh, but also the comparatively warmer and flow-through system of Nantucket Sound, which gives us a pretty diverse uh, shellfish assemblage on both the north side and south side of Cape Cod. Shellfish suitability areas have been mapped for a range of species, uh, and we also have very shallow and very accessible estuaries uh, throughout uh, Massachusetts. Uh, thanks uh, to our Division of Marine Fisheries, and I would like to call out uh, the Deputy uh, Director of the Marine Fisheries Agency, Dan McKiernan, who's here today. Uh, we actually have 305 designated shellfish growing areas uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, incidentally, these maps here that I'm showing you, they're accessible online uh, through a project called Shellfast, which is uh, a GIS mapping program that provides a number of different layers uh, of the geo, and spatial, uh, and political boundaries uh, around the Massachusetts coastal environment uh, as a tool to help with uh, shellfish projects specifically. Uh, and we also have more than 1.5 million acres of approved or conditionally approved uh, waters that are for uh, and available to shellfish generally. Also to characterize shellfish in Massachusetts, uh, Massachusetts as a commonwealth uh, is often referred to as what's a home rule state, uh, which basically means that the 351 communities in Massachusetts uh, have been delegated authority uh, to basically be self-governing uh, through uh, the administration, uh, the governor's office, the legislature, uh, and through the Massachusetts state constitution. Uh, relative to shellfish, uh, this is particularly significant uh, with regard to the 59 coastal communities that work in partnership with the state's Division of Marine Fisheries uh, to engage in a range of shellfish resource enhancement activities, including the regulation uh, of shellfish aquaculture. Uh, 
Uh, many of these management strategies, uh, they include things like contaminated relay uh, stock from contaminated payments, uh, where shellfish is moved, depurated and then opened for commercial recreational harvest, uh, as well as depuration of contaminated shell stock at one of the state's managed uh, shellfish depuration facilities in Newburyport, Massachusetts, as well as very specific uh, shellfish propagation activities that, as this slide uh, indicates from the town of Falmouth, uh, look a lot like uh, commercial shellfish aquaculture operations, uh, with one primary exception uh, in that the shellfish that are grown in these situations are, are primarily harvested from these grow-outs and then transplanted for recreational and <coughs> commercial harvest. And I'll talk a little bit more about the significance of that relative to the Mass Shellfish Initiative when I get into that. The towns also engage in a range of shellfish programs and services that are aimed at enhancing ecosystem services associated with uh, the range of shellfish species that are provided by healthy shellfish populations. Uh, in fact, just last year uh, in Cape Cod through the Barnesville County Municipal Shellfish Program, Barnesville County is the county that governs most of the activities uh, throughout Cape Cod. Uh, ju just last year, 36 million uh, seed uh, oysters were provided uh, through uh, several different towns in Cape Cod to help with enhancement activity that were broadcast uh, through remote set activity, working with the commercial hatchery in Massachusetts, and then broadcast out to those invaders to enhance, uh, again, not only the shellfish populations, but the environmental impact that those populations have. We also have uh, quite a range of restoration efforts, uh, shellfish habitat restoration efforts that are underway, uh, that again are primarily aimed at restoring the ecosystem services associated with healthy shellfish populations. In many ways, these restoration efforts uh, tie into commercial and recreational uh, shellfish activity as a result of the eventual disposition uh, of those shellfish. So when they are eventually planted and harvested, they certainly have an impact on market and access uh, around shellfish generally. Although we now have firm numbers of what is actually harvested recreationally uh, from the towns, uh, we assume that it's a pretty significant volume based on literally thousands of recreational, both non-resident and resident licenses that are sold by those 59 communities that I mentioned uh, throughout Massachusetts coastline. But based on the well-documented ecosystem services that come from healthy shellfish populations, uh, for the economic and environmental reasons, we've also seen a number of different mitigation efforts uh, that come up uh, to restore habitat that might otherwise be lost by different projects. I've listed just a couple here, co-op restoration work in the city of New Bedford based on a marine terminal that was put in that required mitigation of 24.5 million uh, seed uh, cohog over years to be planted within that community and in outlying communities. And Buzzards Bay shellfish restoration work that came as a result of the Bouchard oil spill in the early 2000s that had the state working with nine different communities, again, for shellfish enhancement restoration activity. Uh, one of the more significant ones, I'll just jump to the bottom bullet on this slide, is recent work uh, in the approval of a, uh, a, a 208 water quality plan uh, by Barnesville County and, and by, by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that was for Barnesville County and Cape Cod uh, that included shellfish as a part of uh, the restoration efforts to re remediate nitrogen loading by using shellfish as typically the low hanging fruit rather than multi millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars uh, for sewering uh, Cape Cod. Uh, to, to remedy some of the current non-point uh, pollution sources. Uh, I'd also be remiss uh, if I didn't mention uh, beyond the natural resources that we have that have really helped uh, in the shellfish industry and shellfish populations generally in Massachusetts, uh, we have quite a number of human resources that are available that work and dedicate their work uh, to shellfish in Massachusetts. I've already mentioned state agencies, but in addition to the Division of Marine Fisheries, that's the primary regulatory and oversight agency uh, for the marine environment, as their name implies. The Mass Department of Ag Resources, where I uh, once served as commissioner. Regional aquaculture centers that were set up uh, back in the early 2000s, uh, specifically the Southeastern Mass Aquaculture Center and the Northeastern Mass Aquaculture Center that are administered through Barstow County Cooperative Extension and Salem State College, respectively. Uh, uh, Woods Hole Sea Grant, Martha's Vineyard Shellfish Group, that's been around since the mid-70s. Uh, providing enhancement activity and, and work around shellfish uh, hatchery work in particular, as well as research. Nature Conservancy, Buzzards Bay Coalition, Cape Cod Commercial Fishermen's Alliance, we'll mention a little bit more about in a moment, as well as the two tribes, uh, the Wampanoag Mashpee and the Wampanoag tribe of Gayhead uh, in, in, uh, in Massachusetts. 
Uh, this is certainly not an exhaustive list of all those involved, but it is a list of those that are actively involved at the moment uh, with uh, shellfish activity in Massachusetts. I'm going to switch gears just a little bit now and uh, talk uh, a little bit more about the specifics around shellfish aquaculture in Massachusetts. Uh, this graphic, incidentally, this slide uh, that shows you the, the image of the coastline of Massachusetts, this is from the same mapping uh, program uh, that I showed, those big swatches of open resource classified areas with all the color. Uh, some of you, if I can put the points around this, you can barely see some of the purple coloration. I'm going to show you another slide that really demonstrates where the aquaculture is in Massachusetts. Uh, but it's pretty small and a very small percentage of the overall uh, open water that we have in Massachusetts. And again, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But regardless of those 59 towns I mentioned, 30 of those towns do have active uh, shellfish farms in place now. Uh, the average per town ranges anywhere from a half an acre for some new towns like the town of Dartmouth, where I grew up, uh, all the way up to 261 uh, acres in the town of Wellfleet that's long been known uh, for its, uh, its production of shellfish, both wild and, and aquaculture. As far as average acres per farm, there's also a range there, half an acre, again, from the town of place, place like Dartmouth, but other towns as well, uh, all the way up to 100 acres uh, for one farm in the town of Manapoison, down along the south coast of, of Massachusetts. Overall, the average is about three acres, just north of three acres, but there is quite a bit of range around the size of those operations to begin with. We're predominantly an Easter oyster growing state, although we also have engaged for a long time in the cultivation of, of products like quahog, the hard shell clam, as well as soft shell clam, blue mussel, surf clam, razor clam, base skull. A new entrant where there's some research underway now is on blood arc, and there were some commercial sales of blood arc that were farmed in Massachusetts last year. And I've included kelp on here, although I know uh, it's certainly not a shellfish. Nonetheless, for the polyculture value that we're seeing, we're seeing some. In fact, three sites, I believe, at the moment uh, where oyster growers in particular are looking at kelp production as a, an off cycle, a cyclical crop that they can crop in the wintertime uh, versus their summer activities around, around oysters. So here's a little bit of a clearer slide of what uh, aquaculture looks like in Massachusetts. Uh, regarding things that have changed little, uh, and there are some things that have changed little, uh, despite or possibly a result of all of that productivity area that I mentioned, uh, of those 1.5 million acres, uh, we currently have about 1,300 acres that are currently under cultivation in Massachusetts. That's actually changed little in the last 20 years. Uh, in full disclosure, as you heard earlier, I served as the first aquaculture program coordinator going back to the early 90s. And at that point, we had somewhere around 1,100 acres under cultivation. So it has moved little, but as you'll see, uh, the productivity that's come off of those acres has increased uh, pretty, pretty significantly. I'd also like to note uh, some shifts in attitudes around aquaculture generally in Massachusetts. Again, back 20 years ago, cities like Gloucester and New Bedford who were known, and still are, for their strong uh, commercial fishing industry. You really couldn't say back in 1994 when the first swath of federal regulations came in that impacted the wild fishery, you couldn't say words like aquaculture in those towns. Uh, today, those towns are actually becoming more engaged in developing their own aquaculture projects and in fact, most recently, the city of New Bedford uh, put out a request for information uh, to look at where there would be interest uh, in indeed getting engaged in shellfish aquaculture or aquaculture generally in 8,400 acres of land that they controlled uh, outside of uh, the city of New Bedford. So certainly those attitudes have, have changed, although the jury is still out on what's happening with New Bedford. Uh, it's nonetheless an indication of those opinions changing our aquaculture. Uh, this slide in particular, and I've confirmed the numbers on this because I knew it was going to raise some eyebrows, uh, gives you some indication of what I mentioned, although the acreage hasn't changed a lot, uh, certainly the productivity per acre has. Uh, what we're seeing as a snapshot, and this is data that was from the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries specifically to Eastern Oyster, uh, and specifically to Eastern Oyster as a farm-raised product, uh, we had uh, an average value per piece, it hasn't changed a lot, of about 59 cents uh, per oyster, although there's certainly been uh, some outliers uh, in some of the, uh, the island communities, Gosnell, et cetera, where they've seen upwards of 80 cents uh, per piece on oysters. But one of the most significant developments is the variation in the acreage and the value per acreage, where it swung, although the average is about $25,000 per acre, and this is again just on oyster production and farm gate value of oyster. Uh, that the range has been anywhere from $87,000 uh, per acre 
uh, all the way down to about $3,000 per acre for communities in Nantucket versus the production in Duxbury and up to Edgartown on Martha's Vineyard. So pretty, pretty significant swings. Uh, another remarkable shift that has occurred relative to aquaculture uh, is that at over $28 million now in value, uh, oysters now rank third uh, in, in value of all seafood land in Massachusetts. Uh, at not over 95%, or about $27 million of that $28 million number, that's all from farmed oysters in Massachusetts. Uh, and with <coughs> an economic multiplier of nearly two to one, uh, that's translating to an economic impact on the Commonwealth of Massachusetts of over $50 million. So it's really putting uh, farmed oysters in particular and aquaculture generally uh, at the top of the list for an industry that's now having rather significant economic impact and significant attention put to it uh, in, in Massachusetts. And although there's been some continued great success uh, for aquaculture, as I mentioned, and oysters in particular, mass, uh, looking over the last decade, uh, we're seeing a growth, growing delta uh, between the volume of oysters produced and the value of that, of that product. Uh, this is a concern, it's not a surprise, it's supply, demand, economics, uh, but nonetheless, as oyster growers are, are seeing this change and seeing some of the prices soften, uh, they're starting to ask more about what can be done about improving uh, existing uh, or developing new markets. We're hopeful, some of you may have heard, that there's been some development with opening up the EU uh, for uh, shellfish, starting with those produced from Massachusetts and Washington State. And we're hopeful that as those markets open, they'll provide a benefit not only for shellfish from Massachusetts, but for other states uh, as that expands. And we do expect that it will. Now I'm going to roll more specifically into the Massachusetts Shellfish Initiative. Uh, questions like those that I just mentioned around the marketability and market expansion uh, for oysters in Massachusetts are certainly among the drivers that have caused the development of the Massachusetts Shellfish Initiative. The MSI, as again, as I'll refer to it throughout the presentation, uh, was a project of the Cape Cod Commercial Fishermen's Alliance, the Nature Conservancy, and the Massachusetts Aquaculture Association in partnership with the Division of Marine Fisheries, UMass Boston, and the Governor's Office by way of the Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs uh, in Massachusetts. An initial scoping survey, the preliminary work for the MSI was done all the way back in 2017 uh, when the project partners who I just mentioned convened, uh, and they executed a survey through uh, an environmental clinic uh, at UMass Boston. Those survey results are available online. I'll give you a URL at the end of the presentation that shows you where all of this information can be found for the, the National Shellfish Initiative. Rather than describe the characteristics of each one of the organizations that were part of the initiation of the MSI, uh, it's more important to really define uh, who they represent. And that's public, recreational, commercial harvest, both farmed and wild harvest of shellfish, as well as shellfish restoration efforts. As, as you can imagine, uh, there are some differences, but there's also a lot of commonality and a lot of overlap between the interests of all of these different growers. Primarily, they all center on, on shellfish. But in short, the MSI was envisioned as an opportunity to establish a forum where the broad range of issues, concerns, and opportunities could be discussed among the different stakeholder <coughs> groups that were all a part of uh, and were relate, related to uh, shellfish in, in Massachusetts. So immediate uh, outcomes and targets that are on, on the deck at the moment for the MSI, and despite knowing how challenging it is and, and has been uh, to pull the various groups together, uh, the MSI organized, applied for, and were awarded a two-year grant from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Uh, that grant is what's supporting the efforts now for convening meetings, uh, gathering input, documenting the process, and eventually writing a strategic plan uh, and guidance uh, for uh, the communities across Massachusetts. As mentioned, it's hoped that the MSI plan will provide some recommendations aimed at supporting all stakeholders. Not unlike what you all heard earlier uh, with, uh, I think it was Brian Beal's talk, looking for resources that help uh, on the shellfish programs generally. So part of that effort is certainly to identify that, those opportunities. So defining what MSI is and what MSI isn't, uh, I think it's very important uh, and it has been very important to define to the various communities across uh, Massachusetts uh, what it is and isn't. Uh, in short, uh, it is a, uh, an effort to look at nearshore shellfish resources, those regulated primarily by the state and those local municipalities, not to look at uh, the offshore resources like the sea scallop industry that is uh, present in, in Massachusetts. Uh, 
It's also, as I've already mentioned, an opportunity to convene these different stakeholder groups to have discussions for, for, to refine solutions and ultimately look at ways that they can balance the growing demands associated with shellfish and shellfish resources in, in Massachusetts. Uh, importantly, and this is one that we've tried to emphasize repeatedly, the MSI is not a regulatory body, although certainly regulators are at the table. Uh, the reason they are at the table, as well as legislative folks are at the table, I'll give you a breakdown of who is on the MSI task force, is so that ultimately any recommendations that come forward, if they do have legs and they do have consensus, that they could move forward to help improve uh, the regulations, the statutes, et cetera, including funding uh, around shellfish in Massachusetts. Again, the MSI is meant to enhance shellfish opportunities for all user groups, uh, and uh, we are hopeful that all of those user groups will continue to provide input uh, through the MSI process. So why now uh, for Massachusetts? You've heard some of the concerns mentioned in earlier presentations uh, this morning. Uh, we've seen increased demand uh, for statewide monitoring due to increased frequency and closures around various disease outbreaks, including norovirus, vibrio, harmful algal blooms. The proposed shifts in regulatory procedures associated with shellfish aquaculture. There are proposed legislative initiatives, not only at the state level, uh, for items like uh, fast-tracking restoration efforts that have little or no public comment, uh, but also at the federal level, uh, Senator Wickers uh, from Mississippi had proposed an Aqua Act uh, to look at expanding offshore aquaculture that could certainly have impact on nearshore aquaculture efforts. Demand for shellfish resources is high and continuing to grow, uh, and it's not only high for the product itself, but also for the areas where shellfish are grown uh, and harvested from. This creates potential conflicts with waterfront homeowners, boaters, beachgoers, as well as the shellfish businesses themselves. Uh, many towns have wait lists for residents. In fact, there was a survey back in 2016 of Cape Cod towns that indicated waiting lists of up to 178 or more people looking to get into shellfish aquaculture. As was already mentioned, towns are turning to shellfish to clean up estuaries. The 208 water quality plan is one of the most significant. Uh, that has created concern based on the increased volume of product that it would bring on the market and the impact uh, that that increased volume would have on pricing for those engaged in either wild harvest and sales or, or shellfish aquaculture activity. Restoration advocates are also uh, becoming more involved with creating things like oyster reefs or clam flats that likewise from the harvest of that product would have an impact for sure on the market. Uh, and more shellfish in the water uh, ultimately means more risk or concern of disease, uh, which also translates to a need uh, for more uh, research activity. Some growers have also reported, despite the graphic I show you at 59 cents per piece, uh, that prices did soften last year uh, for oysters, uh, and they're predicting increased production based on an increased number of farms, uh, not necessarily in acreage, but the increased productivity that we're seeing, that also is creating some concern for the market itself. And I've already mentioned New Bedford's proposal, although the jury is still out, even if we see upwards of 200 to, say, 500 acres, that's leased out uh, for shellfish aquaculture activity, certainly that would have an impact on the market itself. And as a result of these increased activities around shellfish, not only through wild harvesters, through aquaculture operations, recreational activity, as well as restoration work, uh, there are growing concerns of competing interests and issues between all of those different stakeholder total groups. Not surprising. Another driver for this has been the National Shellfish Initiative. It was created back in 2011. Uh, no funding came with this, but it was an encouragement from NOAA for communities like Massachusetts to ultimately work on and improve conditions for shellfish uh, in, in the state. Uh, Massachusetts is certainly not uh, first to the table on this. There are, are and have been a number of efforts already underway, uh, and the first of those Washington State uh, in 2011, but as you can see here all the way up until 2018, uh, North Carolina, Gulf of Mexico, Shellfish Initiative, uh, all of they, them are also looking at these kinds of issues related to shellfish generally, again, not just in any, any one of those different stakeholder holding groups. And I would encourage you, these are all hyperlinks, I can share these with folks later on uh, and copy the presentation folks want to get to these, but if you just Google the NOAA uh, Shellfish Initiative, you'll find links to all of these. Other drivers, I mentioned that in my very first slide a, uh, of the MSI uh, was a survey that was done in 2017. Uh, certainly the results uh, from that have also served as a driver 
uh, for the need uh, to look at an MSI, to further develop an MSI that could explore uh, other opportunities and options uh, relative to shellfish. Things like increasing shellfish resources in the Commonwealth, raising the viability and status of shellfish generally, uh, like Maine and most other states, uh, shellfish and the improvement of marine aquatic systems are not the only things that those states have to be concerned with. Uh, things like broadband access, uh, home heating, transportation, etc. Those things are all competing interests uh, with shellfish in all of our coastal states. So by having a group like an MSA that can advocate on broad terms, it gives you a competitive opportunity to convene all the various stakeholders and really demonstrate the broad impact that things like an, a, a shellfish initiative can have. Also importantly from that initial survey, um, more of those 400 survey respondents, uh, there were uh, 72 members of the general public. Uh, these are folks who had really nothing to do specifically or directly with shellfish. But nonetheless, they all indicated they thought it was important to see more activity around shellfish based on those broad benefits that shellfish can, can bring. This is especially critical if you start to look at the broad uh, impact of legislative and political policy uh, around shellfish and how to gain more support uh, for shellfish resources. So ultimately on the task force responsibilities itself, uh, in order to have the strong process, and again this was as indicated, uh, really a uh, grassroots, uh, not a government-led initiative to begin with, uh, we needed to find a diverse range of, in, a, for input and expanding beyond those initial organizing stakeholders uh, so that we could get to generate the political support necessary uh, to implement any recommendations that may come uh, from the MSI. Uh, this broadening was represented by the convening of the task force uh, of 19 different members that have currently met. That incidentally, it's also important to note uh, that as we have had many uh, public outreach meetings, uh, there's a need to expand uh, this task force now, and recommendations will be coming uh, to make sure that everyone who should be at the table is at the table to represent their interests as we talk about shellfish generally. So more than the individuals who are listed here, it's really important to look at the organizations and what they represent. Again, that's what will give strength uh, to the recommendations and any proposals that come in the long range from uh, an MSI effort. The first meeting of the task force was held on January 2nd, 2019. That's two years later than the initial survey was done. Uh, and in large part, that delay was a result of the executive office saying that they wanted to be a part of this initiative because they too had seen a need to get more stakeholder input and the variety of things that they're engaged in, not limited to uh, regulatory comment uh, from those stakeholders, but really taking a broad look at the various stakeholder groups that could be influenced by different regulatory efforts. The MSI has not specifically determined what its overall objectives are. That is really going back to the task force members themselves. Uh, and they have not yet finalized their final process, but the one commitment they've made is to ensure that there is ample and adequate uh, public involvement uh, of all stakeholders as a part of this process. We've determined this is more, they, at that first meeting, they determined there was more need uh, to look at the status, to get a situational analysis uh, of what the conditions were surrounding shellfish in Massachusetts. They formed a, a, an assessment uh, committee, uh, and they also created a steering committee to help steer the process. The steering committee responsible organizations included Chris Scalacci uh, from the Division of Marine Fisheries, who is their aquatic biologist and, uh, and shellfish aquaculture specialist, Melissa Sanderson from the Cape Cod Commercial Fishermen's Alliance, Chris Sherman, uh, who former president of the Mass Aquaculture Association and president and CEO of Island Creek Oyster, uh, Steve Kirk from the Nature Conservancy, uh, and supported by myself as a consultant, as well as uh, Sean McNally, who's a PhD candidate uh, from, from UMass Boston. The assessment committee itself was really charged with three uh, primary items uh, and we're charged with generating a situational analysis by the next meeting uh, of the task force. Right now that meeting is scheduled for April 3rd, although we expect that that meeting is going to be moved back to a later date in April so that we can accommodate uh, the most folks for the task force to attend. Uh, ultimately they'll be looking at and have started to look at an assessment of capacity and status uh, of state government and non-government support and programming around shellfish, including but not limited to staffing, labs, hatcheries, research, monitoring, basically the whole ball of wax associated with the shellfish generally. Assess the status of existing strategic plans and goals, not only at the municipal level, but at the state uh, and broadly through the regional level, and also to compile different public input that's already been provided uh, through a variety of surveys and agency results 
uh, around comment associated with, uh, with regulations and public input uh, for shellfish generally. So again, uh, like the task force itself, uh, the assessment committee uh, is, uh, is a broad representation of all, all stakeholders. Uh, at the first meeting of the assessment committee, which was on February 6th, uh, when asked uh, for volunteers to chair, uh, we're grateful that uh, Jeff Kennedy from the Mass Division of Fisheries raised his hand. Uh, he was elected uh, by the committee members itself. Uh, and although uh, the assessment committee and the task force generally uh, is not a, uh, defined as a public body, so subject to open meeting laws in Massachusetts. We are functioning as such uh, and can keeping minutes, recording those minutes, as well as announcing meetings ahead of time and posting all that information so that as many folks, again, can be a part of that process to collect all of this input. On a media timeline, uh, right now the situational assessment is underway. Uh, there's been a survey that has been developed and is right now being reviewed by the assessment committee members uh, that will go to those 59 coastal communities, shellfish advisory boards, shellfish constables, to get a snapshot of what those resources are that they have and or need at the, at the local level. Uh, there was also discussion at that first meeting of the assessment committee to put together a survey of all uh, commercial harvesters and that it will be followed up on, although right now it's not possible in the timeline that we have but at a later date, we will be sending surveys out, likely through the Division of Maine Fisheries of those different stakeholders. Ultimately, this group will provide uh, feedback and a report to the task force when it meets next. Again, currently planned for April 3rd, uh, but it may be a later date at this point, but will we'll likely be. At the, the draft agenda for that next meeting of the task force includes a review of the assessment committee results, determining next steps for the MSI, uh, drafting MSI objectives, although we did have an exercise in the first meeting that generally framed what all of those at the table wanted to see, uh, and ultimately to create any additional committees that then need to do further work uh, for the, uh, to achieve the objectives of the, of the task force itself. So again, the MSI is not a government entity. It's not bound by public meeting laws specifically, but we are acting as though it is, and providing all of the information up front and outwards. Uh, you have here on the screen uh, two different URLs. Uh, one is uh, to a calendar, that's the meeting URL, that shows you where all of those meetings are being held, including this meeting is on the calendar itself, as well as the MassShellfishInitiative.org resources page, which lists all the presentations. This one will eventually be up there, as well as presentations that have already been given uh, to many different uh, communities uh, in, in Massachusetts. Uh, at the request of the different shellfish advisory communities, primarily down in the Cape, but there's also one coming up in Duxbury this next week, uh, we've been providing all of these information presentations specifically uh, demystify the MS Shellfish Initiative and answer questions that have a lot, not surprisingly come up around what the MSI is and what its intent, intent is, is, uh, is in the long run. It's not been an easy process uh, to pull all these things together. It is still uh, riddled with challenges and misconception and misperceptions about what the MSI is. Uh, but we are getting there and we think that we have turned the corner in really getting the word out about the benefits that can come from an initiative like this. Uh, some examples that have already come up uh, that are proposed as what the MSI might uh, be able to address are things like guidelines for restoration of, of, of nitrogen uh, mitigation, nitrogen mitigation projects. As I've already mentioned, there certainly could be and likely will be and has been already uh, from some of these efforts impact on market. Uh, those considerations were not conceived in the first part of the process. Uh, education outreach uh, to community support, again, not only to those involved directly with the industry, but those that are impacted. They might be waterfront homeowners, uh, they might be have riparian rights, they might be folks who are indirectly related to this that ultimately could help with longer term support. Uh, again, addressing solutions that are softening some of the oyster prices in particular, reducing interagency conflicts on the regulation side, maintaining healthy ecosystems while allowing growth of shellfish industries generally, identifying resources and accommodating the growth demands for monitoring, permitting, etc. Uh, and the last, I'll just jump to the last bullet, because that one has certainly come up over and over again, is how do we deal with legislative proposals uh, that are coming uh, from different groups, including the Mass Aquaculture Association, now looking at how do they uh, ultimately have better continuity and transfer of shellfish businesses that in some cases 
they're only allowed to transfer to lists that are maintained uh, by the, the communities themselves. Again, coming back to that home rule status that I mentioned. So in the long run, MSI, we're hoping, will provide an agreement across user groups uh, that will be needed to promote the environmental, economic, and cultural importance of shellfish in Massachusetts, provide credibility uh, to the existing future shellfish and any existing future shellfish projects, uh, and to earn funding, importantly, as well as community support for shellfish amongst a myriad of other issues that all of our communities have to contend with. Importantly, <laughs> also improve communications between the various resource user groups, provide user-driven recommendations for possible future policy, regulation, legislative changes that may come associated with shellfish, building foundation support uh, for the growth that's already occurred uh, in Massachusetts, uh, and finally, provide a framework uh, for how do we handle increased shellfish supply uh, in the state. And again, those were just some of the items that have come up that may or may not be taken up by the MSI, but they are items that are coming as a result of these discussions. Uh, for any questions, contact information up here for myself, uh, as well as uh, the steering committee for the Mass Shellfish Initiative. I encourage you to look at massshellfishinitiative.org. Uh, all of the information that I've talked about, including presentations, is up there. Uh, and uh, again, I thank you for the opportunity to come and talk with you today. start with the last part of that. We are not looking to expand to any other state. This has to be, if it occurs in your state, it has to happen by the folks who leave your state. It has to occur that way. And likewise, I mean, just replace the names Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries with your Division of Marine Fisheries up here in Maine. The other groups that you have, the Maine Aquaculture Association. I mean, you have the same types of groups. You have the same people, generally. The same, you have commercial fishers. You have aquaculture operations. You have stakeholders, shorefront, water, waterfront property owners. You have basically the same ball of not only stakeholders that are involved with shellfish, but you also have, in my opinion, many of the same issues and concerns around funding, support, access, etc. So uh, I would encourage it as an opportunity from what I've seen from the other states. It has been a benefit to get all of those voices heard. Uh, rather than what's often happened is discussions over a year between those individual groups that just start pointing fingers at the other groups rather than working collectively to try to provide something that can ultimately benefit the whole industry. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, yeah. Is all your leases uh, being held by people who own property around the Bay Area for the farming? No. No. In fact, the uh, there are some. Uh, Massachusetts is unique, I think, in that it also had King's Grants. You've heard me mention lease a few times. Uh, that because of those King's grants, there were property rights associated with those. But in large part, uh, the process, the way it works now, uh, individuals, and then varies for a town, but most towns have a residency requirement, so you need to live in the town. Then you apply through the town for a shellfish uh, growing area. That town then needs to be assessed by the State Division of Marine Fisheries uh, to ensure that it will not have a negative impact on other resources. One of the things I didn't mention is that uh, Unfortunately, uh, in my opinion, uh, for aquaculture, uh, it's not where it's best for aquaculture, but it's where nothing else wants to be. You said, and you that's said, you said there was 170 people on a waiting list. That's right. Is that wild harvesters on a waiting list that want to get leasing? Many of them are, and, and we used in the early days uh, something we call the new pickup truck phenomenon. <laughs> that especially in places like Wellfleet, when that first uh, clam grower at that point drove out of the flats in that new pickup truck, although I wouldn't recommend it with all the salt damage they got, uh, that ultimately it really started other commercial harvesters looking at that as a real opportunity to be in the same business that they were essentially, but ultimately control more, more directly the volume and how much they harvest and where they sold it. One more question. Yep. Uh, is the wild harvester exempt from I don't know the answer to that question. I know by value, the value is certainly way in favor, 95%, as I indicated, for oysters, uh, uh, for aquaculture, farm raising. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes. So, would the small independent guy get kind of pushed out by the agriculture? 
No, many of those small independent guys are becoming aquaculture farmers and have become many aquaculture farmers. So they basically they own what they. That's right. So they, it's a lease agreement. And one of the reasons I brought up the legislation is what's happened now in Massachusetts it's over 20, 30, so more than 30 years. Uh, shellfish growers and some of those businesses that are now branding their products, specifically items like oysters, they can be branded. Uh, they have invested multi millions of dollars in some cases into grow operations that are very dependent on that grow operation itself, the site itself. Uh, in Massachusetts, because of the regulatory authority delegated to those communities, in some cases the towns don't, don't allow outright transfers of, those, of that land to others who may buy that business in the long run. There's still an approval authority by the local community, and the intent is none of the growers want to see their own advantage taken over by the likes of Coca-Cola or other big corporations. But they want to see the ability to have a return on the investment in those businesses, just like you currently see with uh, license, uh, wild fisheries uh, license endorsements that are oftentimes sold for a much higher value than what they were offering you got in the first place. So they're okay with the wild fishermen? Oh, yeah. Yeah, in fact, what you'll see, and the, the reason that one graphic I spent more time on the overlaying Quahog and Quahog to show the overlap, is that in many cases, commercial shellfish hatcheries, commercial aquaculture operations, are working not only with towns to help propagation activity for a public uh, recreational as well as wild harvest, but working directly to help and plant, uh, in, in put more shellfish in the water itself. The other thing, and some of the scientists in, in the room can speak to this, is because of the mass spawning, and then you saw some of that with some of the soft shell clam presentations, the impact from having more dense, higher densities of shellfish in those communities has in fact benefited the wild fisheries by providing broadcast spawning that also seeds the surrounding areas, not necessarily just on the lease site itself. So there's definitely a lot of, uh, of intermingling, uh, a lot of synergistic support between those various uh, activities, for sure. Any other questions? Yeah. Can I take a question? Sure. On one of your slides, you briefly mentioned that your group is interested in working through differences in opinion about the priorities and the problems. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the process that you set up to work through some of those differences. Yeah. It's, uh, well, we initially uh, proposed a, a several uh, different committees that would come together for the task force to consider uh, to discuss anything from what resources to basically do a, a SWOT analysis, to look at what we have in place, what's needed, what the concerns and challenges are. But in the end, again, the task force itself stepped back. Uh, they wanted to learn more about what the vast uh, characteristics around shellfish in the state were, and ultimately take another snapshot themselves through an assessment committee to, to go out and define what those are. Part of the, the biggest challenge that I've seen with the MSI is because it is forming as we go without having something specifically identified in the long run because it's all being drawn from the community, it makes it very difficult and leads to a lot of suspicion over what it is. So continuing the public out outreach and the public input component uh, is, and I expect will be, the most important and critical piece to all of this, to getting all the folks together to get those opinions. So having those meetings, the task force will meet its plan uh, at least four times over the year. Uh, to bring this input together through the different uh, committees that they put together. But the real heavy lifting is coming back to those committees who, again, are representatives, not only the communities, but that vast range of stakeholders uh, to bring all that input in so that everything can be on the table. Some things there aren't, isn't going to be any consensus on. There isn't going to be any agreement. But for those few that can be, uh, there really could be some significant impact. We expect. Any other questions? Great, well thank you all for having me today.